China is now celebrating the 80th anniversary of the end of the Long March. The epic two-year adversity-filled military retreat led by China's then fledgling Communist Party. But why is a military retreat commemorated? What's its real history? What role did Mao Zedong play? What's the significance of the Long March in modern Chinese history and in the formation of the CPC? What meaning does it have for contemporary China? CPC legitimacy, the CPC's relations with the Kuomintang Party, and cross-strait ties in general. What's the so-called Long March spirit? And how does it affect the current governance of China? Understanding the Long March gets us closer to China. Eighty years ago, the Red Army, led by the CPC, completed its marathon journey. It enabled the Red Army, the forerunner of the People's Liberation Army, to escape encirclement by the Kuomintang, or Nationalist Army, and laid the foundation for the CPC's ultimate victory in China's civil war. The Long March was a great expedition that opened up a new situation. The Long March triumph provided direction and blazed trails. The Long March was not only a process of conquering all difficulties, defeating enemies, and achieving strategic goals, it was also a process of innovating theories and discovering revolutionary paths. To understand the Long March and its spirit, I speak with three historians. Jiang Jianong of the Party History Research Center of the CPC Central Committee. He's director of the department responsible for CPC history from its beginning to 1949. Wang Xincheng of the same center and Zhang Mingjin from the Chinese Academy of Military Sciences. What are some of these specific characteristics, the essential characteristics of the Long March? The Kuomintang army gathered a stronghold of 500,000 soldiers to encircle and surprise the 80,000 force Red Army headquartered in the Central Revolutionary bases. Being significantly outnumbered and outgunned, and following the wrong command, the CPC Red Army suffered a painful defeat in the counter campaign after a protracted warfare. Under the very trying circumstances, the Central Party and the Red Army made a choice for strategic shift in order to preserve the army's force and secure victory in the battle. According to statistics of the First Front Red Army, 263 of the 368 days in total were on the march, and 115 days were spent in battles. The armies had to march 37 kilometers per day on average. Along the path, they had to climb over snowy mountains, wade across treacherous marshes, and survive hot battles. Therefore, the expedition witnessed unprecedented hardships and fierceness. Describe the Long March spirit, but most important, how do those characteristics of the Long March spirit relate to specific activities or actions in the Long March in a historical sense. I am no historian specialized in Long March history, but as I understand it, the Long March spirit is very rich in meaning and cannot possibly be concluded with simple words. However, out of the many precious characteristics, I particularly emphasize four of them. The first is firm conviction, second, tenacious will in combat, third, trust of the general public or unconditional trust, fourth, a spirit of seeking truth out of facts. These are all spiritual treasures the Long March has left for us and should be well inherited or understood.
Christians advocate sacrifice. The long march has done better. Soldiers stood fearless even in front of death, as long as the lofty principle they pursued remained the truth. Isn't it salvation? It gave the Chinese Communist Party a more nationally militant profile, nationally militant profile. In other words, not just a political movement, but a national movement, and also a militant movement capable of engaging in prolonged struggle, physical struggle, armed struggle. Symbolically, of course, it remains and was then already a great, great statement of the determination of the people fighting for change uh, and winning. So it was a historically important milestone. The leaders who knew the essence of fighting the Japanese and KMT after the anti-Japanese war, both in terms of strategies and policies. They stuck to their beliefs and only adjusted their ideology to become strategically brilliant and resilient. This characteristic played a decisive role in the formation of modern China. All these leaders, Mao Zedong and his comrades, undertook the test of the Long March and again proved their brilliant capability in the anti-Japanese war and the civil war that followed. Trace very briefly Mao Zedong's role in each of these phases and how did it evolve over time? Mao Zedong is one Although Mao was chairman of the central government of the Soviet Republic of China, in the beginning he served as a committee member of the Central Politburo. He was excluded in the decision-making circles among the top leadership. However, the marginalized position did not frustrate him. Rather, he made a lot of positive suggestions and preparations for the long march and to a certain extent secured his ascent to power through his persistent efforts along the march. After the Zun Yi conference, Mao's military strategies gained approval of the Central Committee. Mao was only a member of the Politburo Standing Committee of the CPC Central Committee, not a top leader in the party or any nominal top commander, but his military line was accepted by the whole party and the Central Committee because of its strategic brilliance. Therefore, after the Zun Yi conference, he took a central role in the decision-making group. And we're not making such comments because he later held the top leadership position of the CPC. After the Zuni meeting, the Red Army was still being pursued by the Kuomintang Army. The Red Army was almost constantly on the move and, headed by Mao Zedong, engaged in a series of battles, crossing the Qisui River four times before finally escaping from enemy troops. And it was a classic move in the Red Army's long march as it four times crossed the Chu River. It well reflected the highly flexible warfare approach of the Chinese workers and peasants' Red Army. And it adopted a strategic shift and started to take the initiative in the march. It was a classical representation of Mao's military strategy. When Bernard Law Montgomery visited China in the 60s, he asked about the warfare that Mao took most pride in, and the answer was the quadruple crossing of the Chishui River. All countries in their founding have what's called foundational myths. Now, the word myth doesn't mean it's wrong or, or erroneous or, 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 or fictional. But rather, it means it's a kind of an anthropological term to means it is idealized that a real historical events, it, when they were uh, uh, causative of the foundation of countries, begin to have an idealized quality to them, such that the, the real raw history 
is forgotten and just this idealism is, is remembered. Um, it, it, how can you analyze the Long March in terms of this kind of anthropological myth concept, in terms of separating the foundational myth from the real history? The Long March was an arduous struggle initiated out of the party's pursuit of a lofty goal. The participants did not expect to create any fortune for the following generations. They only did what they did out of some pure, simple emotions. The ideal greatly inspired the Chinese, but I do not deny that in some places, especially where red tourism flourishes, mismatches have been witnessed in publications compared with historical recordings. We're taking a very objective viewpoint to study history and make it barely connected with politics. We're not evading the mistakes made in the initial stage in the party's history. I myself have never met any situation where researchers cannot freely share their understanding and interpretation due to influence or pressure from a certain way of thinking. How does the international community look at the Long March? Is it something that's just uh, irrelevant, something in the domestic, or does it, it symbolize the new China? I've read many articles and books written by renowned American scholars. A good example comes from the former deputy editor-in-chief of the New York Times. In America, there's a prominent culture of hero worship. Everybody shares this value. Common public or well-educated scholars are all the same. You can disagree with Mao's ideology and see eye to eye with that of Chiang Kai-shek, or you can disapprove of Mao's deeds later on, but just like Westerners and elite Chinese, you can worship heroes as they've shown spectacular resilience and loyalty in this epic pilgrimage. In today's China, the younger generation in particular, but society in general, are very well off materially, certainly compared to the past. And the generation of the Long March, uh, to many people, uh, seems like ancient history. Uh, do you think the people today in China need to appreciate the suffering and the, and the difficulties faced during the time of the Long March so they could better appreciate the tremendous uh, physical and, and spiritual gains that they have today? Since the reform and opening up, tremendous changes have taken place in our country. Particularly, young people don't have the experience, so they find it a bit difficult to understand the Long March. Then how to add to their experience? I advise them to take a walk by themselves. I've done it. In February 2015, I went to Yunnan, Guizhou and Sichuan provinces, where the mountainous roads are quite dangerous. There was a path which wound up two kilometers with 100 meter cliffs well below. Gravel and rubble is everywhere, making it very difficult to go through. On rainy days, the roads will become slippery and make it more dangerous. As I've gone along the path, I now have a better understanding of how tough the Long March was. With self-experience on the very path the Red Army traveled, we can get a better understanding of the hardships. And we'll feel inspired. If the Red Army could make it, why not us? We will then be encouraged to face up the various difficulties. So I advocate that everybody take a walk on the Long March path. Is there a danger of overemphasizing the Long March such that by re repetition of the same thing over and over again, some people, particularly young people, will begin to have a more cynical attitude towards it? I don't think so. We were young ones as well. So we must share something in common with the young people today. For me, the Long March is a feat that I take pride in. It is a miracle created by the Chinese. Chairman Mao said the Long March was the first ever in the history of mankind. So I don't see any reason for young people to feel repulsed in mentioning it. 
We advocate the spirit, but we're not forcing the young to climb over the snowy mountains or cross the marshes and lead the difficult life. We want them to learn about the glorious past and get strength out of it. To put it properly, the Long March of the Red Army 80 years ago is little known to the young generation today. I myself and people of my age, somewhere in our 60s, received such education when we were young. But nowadays, some of the teachings also fade in our memory. As we celebrate the 80th anniversary of the victory and look back to the tragic history, we're being overwhelmed by the past. It's kind of like a baptism of the mind. In today's contemporary politics, the Kuomintang in Taiwan uh, are more um, uh, coherent with the CPC in China in that both strongly support a one-China policy, whereas perhaps other political parties in Taiwan have differing opinions. In that context and in this rapprochement between the CPC and the Kuomintang today, uh, are there any activities celebrating the Long March in which the um, uh, members of the uh, Kuomintang uh, participate in a broader reconciliation? Me, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, what, why not? The Long March marks a spectacular milestone in the CPC's party history, but never so for the KMT. That's why the answer is no. No. <laughs> if we have a look at the books published under this theme, there are quite some memoir collections on how the Kuomintang circled the Red Army. We do look forward to more exchanges with scholars in Taiwan. We have a lot of common topics, especially on some issues during the anti-Japanese war or on relationship with the Kuomintang. We can freely discuss these problems now. We're quoting a lot of documents in the Taiwan Data Center and receive recognition from certain Taiwan scholars. We do hope for more such exchanges. The Long March was a seminal event in modern Chinese history in general and obviously the uh, CPC in particular. What is a semiotic analysis of the Long March? As we know, the Long March uh, was meant to be a military retreat by the Red Army, but what it has brought about is much more than the march itself. Uh, and uh, people at different times may interpret the Long March in different ways and from different perspectives. Uh, as we know, Chairman Moore uh, called the Long March uh, Manifesto, uh, a publicity team, a seeding machine. And in the re uh, Revolutionary War years, uh, the Long March stands for uh, patriotism, nationalism, and so on. And in the peacetime, uh, the Long March uh, represents uh, indom indomitable spirits uh, fearlessness of uh, uh, hardships, uh, perseverance, and so on. If we take the Long March as a sign, what can a semiotic analysis of that sign help us in enriching our understanding of the Long March? People today may consider it uh, as an example uh, or a symbol. Uh, we can uh, apply it in our uh, in our work. Uh, maybe in some particular situation, we need to uh, think of some strategy to deal with the difficulties. So, uh, the long march to Chinese people has a special meaning. Uh, it stands for a spirit. We have a rocket called a uh, Long March rocket, right? So here, people uh, connect the historical event of the Long March with the uh, scientific development in China. That is a kind of meaning making. 
China talks a lot about its culture and its tradition, which certainly has uh, aspects that are similar with other countries, but also aspects that are unique to China, its size, its population, its uh, various uh, uh, cultural traditions, uh, both philosophically and, um, and, and culturally. Does the Long March, as part of China's history and culture, uh, support the idea that what happens in China has differences with other countries and therefore policy decisions or political structures that China has today may also differ from that of other countries. The Long March itself is to a certain extent characteristic of our own Chinese traditions. In the grand context of the world, we are well aware that different countries have different cultural traditions. So what works successfully for China is not necessarily the same for the world. What does it mean? It means that whatever we do, we should take the practical conditions into consideration. We used to simply model ourselves on others' experiences. For instance, we tried to copy the Soviet Union in the initiating revolution in a similar way, but we suffered from painful defeats. So we should take in the essence, the fundamental principles of theories like Marxism, and tailor our measures according to our own conditions. How important is the Long March in the party being at the vanguard of society and the leading, playing the leading role in society? Uh, how has that is historical event uh, become meaningful over the ensuing eight decades to today? The top one is of paramount significance, that is, ideals and conviction. Everything becomes empty talk without it. For instance, the legitimacy of the CPC's governance comes from its ideals to serve the interests of the general public. If it goes against the public welfare, if it does not work for the betterment of the nation and the people, then it has no position to rule anymore. The difference between an official and a revolutionist, a party member, is that the latter works not for one's own interests, but for the interests of the nation and the people, for social justice, for national prosperity, for great rejuvenation of the country. If one leaves this noble calling behind and focuses on seeking personal benefits, for promotion in one's career, then the result can never be good. Therefore, legitimacy for the establishment of the CPC first comes from the purpose and conviction of the party. It is set up to promote social advancement in line with the interests of the public and the best interests of the Chinese people. Its purpose dictates its legitimacy. The second source for the legitimacy comes from approval of the general public. The people support the party, so the party enjoys legitimacy among the people. The Long March covered 14 provinces in regions where 200 million people lived. In the past, people barely knew about the CPC or the Red Army. But the Long March helped greatly with the publicity as people could see how the party acted out their advice in actual practice. Throughout the journey, the anti-Japanese flag used along the path northward became very popular. It became the symbol of the final victory and helped the general public understand that the CPC was not only a party that went against class oppression. Moreover, it aimed to help the 90% of workers and peasants get rid of enslavery from the exploiting classes and improve their living standards. President Xi Jinping uh, gave a speech by stating that each generation should have its kind of long march. Uh, how, how do you interpret that statement? 
The traditional Long March was a feat accomplished by leaders represented by Mao Zedong and his counterparts in the CPC. Now, President Xi Jinping is calling for the Long March spirit as we devote ourselves to the new career of developing socialism with Chinese characteristics. This is a new grand career, which is arduous and painstaking. President Xi has commented, we're always on our own long march. Chinese leaders are also used to quoting the long march for its symbolic significance. When the new China was about to be founded in 1949, Mao said that the establishment of the new country after victory of the revolution was just like the first step of the long march. As we know, the CPC bears two historical missions. One was to seek for independence of the nation and liberation of the people. The other was to pursue prosperity of the nation and happiness for the people. If establishment of new China is compared to the first step in the long march, now we're entering the decisive stage of developing a moderately prosperous society. The task ahead remains daunting and challenging. That is to say, we're about to accomplish many new noble tasks featured with characteristics of the new historical period. Whenever something goes wrong with a certain aspect of work or decision, there might be a tremendous impact upon the social stability and development. The Chinese tradition is to think for the worst. It is advocated that one should put oneself in the worst scenarios and get prepared for the worst condition to happen, and then strive for the best outcome. From this perspective, we do need to take a new look of the task in front and reinterpret it as a new round of the long march in history. It is good and proper for a nation to celebrate its foundational events. For China, the Long March represents the CPC's revolutionary struggle, gaining mass support, establishing its historical legitimacy. And it symbolizes persistence, overcoming adversity, and achieving great goals. Each generation should appreciate the sacrifices of their forefathers as they seek to surmount their own obstacles and realize their own ambitions. Thus, the spirit of the Long March seeks to engender patriotism and national unity, deemed critical in addressing China's problems. The spirit exemplifies independent thinking, decision-making based on reality, relying on the general public, and daring to innovate. Characteristics, the CPC says, enable the Long March and exemplifies the CPC's own leading position in China's political structure. Celebratory media should be appropriate, lest it become counterproductive. Different voices should be heard, evidencing social confidence. And scholarly exchange can facilitate historical reconciliation. The Long March links past and future, keeping us closer to China.